in between the shade and the shadow in the silence of the sound here is where I find a blue hole where there's no one else around his face is hidden in the darkness he has a name that no one knows He walks and yet he leaves no footprints That reveal where he goes I have traveled such a long way I'm at the end of my line have a song to teach me I don't have much more time I've been trying to find you where have you been so long will you send word to my sweet margarita Will you finish my song? The desert air ripples around him Waves of heat from the earth I do not know whether I found him followed me from birth His voice is like an ancient river Cut through a canyon of stone The raven that has kept me on my journey Has left me here to face him alone traveled such a long way I'm at the end of my line Do you have a song to teach me? I don't have much more time I've been trying to find you Send word to my sweet margarita Will you finish my song? He gives me some strange herbal powder My skin flushes with red heat Feel a surge of mystic power The earth recedes below my feet His incantation like an echo Fading away within my mind The sun sinks low to the horizon be the time I have traveled such a long way I'm at the end of my line Do you have a song to teach me? I don't have much more time trying to find you where have you been so long will you send word to my sweet margarita will you finish
finish my song Will you finish my song Will you finish my song And that was Dr. Kevin Holm Hudson on Overtones. And I know you're resisting trying to like ring that bell again. So let's just hold off until after he's done. <laughs> Warren does not follow instructions. He's a rebel, folks. <laughs> yes, he's a rebel. So we have Dr. Kevin Holm Hudson with us, author of the book, Music Theory Remix. Kevin, you have a very different and interesting way of teaching theory of music. How would you best describe your teaching techniques? Well, I've taught at UK for 18 years, and prior to that, I was at Northwestern University for six, so I guess it's about a quarter of a century that I've been using popular music in the classroom alongside the uh, customary classical pieces that one would expect in a college music theory program. So I tend to not teach things on a historical track, so we don't necessarily start with this is the Baroque period and we're gonna move our way through the classical and romantic and so on. But instead I go by concepts. So if there's a particular scale or a particular musical concept that we're gonna be learning, I'll find an example from Bach, but I might also find an example from Thelonious Monk or an example from Nirvana, and so the students are constantly uh, given a variety of examples in the classroom. And I should mention also that one thing I do with my, my freshmen uh, every year, I normally teach first semester freshman theory, so I've got these students who are just coming into college, and their very first assignment that I have them do is to send me YouTube links to three of their desert island favorite pieces. And they can be any genre. I just tell them, as long as it's something that I can play in front of my mom, so you know there can't be anything with a lot of strong profanity or misogyny or you know nothing like that. But it, it doesn't matter to me what style it is. And so I will get examples of you know, symphonic classical music like Mahler or Mozart. But I'll also get some Toby Keith or I'll get some techno things or I'll get a, some film music and I go through and I listen to every single one of those things that I get from the students and I spend the first few weeks of the semester just writing down what I hear and what I can use you know here's a good example of this particular kind of scale or here's a really good example of three-part form and, and and things like that okay. and then as and then what I ha what I have by the time I'm done is this collection of great teaching resources that the students provided me at the beginning of the year and so um, one, one great example that I can share was with a student in one of my classes um, whose name was Emily. And mo you know, not to stereotype, but most students that I've known named Emily tend to be very quiet and reserved. <laughs> uh, well, this, this Emily was very much into heavy metal. And so she gave me several examples of just like, like growly metal, you know, those kind of things. Well, one of them happened to be a really great example of a particular mode called the Locrian mode, which is like this really weird, it's like. That kind of scale, which, um, that wasn't right, was it? right it is right I had to think about it though but for a second I'm like am I playing Phrygian no, no that's, that's Locrian exactly what I yeah yeah no yeah yeah because <laughs> and, and that just illustrates the point because it's such a it's such an unusual mode you usually don't find it used but here was this really great example of a metal tune that was in this Locrian mode all right so we were doing different modes and I'm playing these different examples and I have like you know Johnny Cash I hurt myself today for you know Aeolian mode and so forth and I got to Locrian mode and I put on this metal example. And, you know, shy, quiet, reserved Emily in the front row goes, Yes! <laughs> Everybody turns around and looked at her, you know, but she's just like, That's my song! That's my song! You know, and I get that a lot when, when a student hears their song that they gave me at the beginning of the semester a couple weeks later in the class. It's a great way of just validating the student, you know, that your, your taste, your background matters and it's important in the classroom. Well, I think that's just fantastic. That's 
So you're going to demonstrate one of those creative ways that you do this today. Yes. And this is... Is this in the book that you wrote? But it's also become a YouTube. It, it, it's actually it's it, it, with the book itself um, because it does cover a lot of material. It's intended for the first two years of college music theory instruction and potentially beyond that. So it really covers a lot of material, and the publishers were very interest, much interested in trying to keep the page count down so that you have a book that actually fits in people's bags, you know, and doesn't cost too much and so forth. And so we came up with a lot of materials to put online. And so along with the book itself, there are a number of downloadable web essays where if a student wants to learn more about a particular topic, they can go to this particular website and download the material for free. And so this particular lesson was one of those web essays. I've made a series of teaching videos to go with the book, um, mainly because at the time the, pu the publisher had suggested that for some of the sales reps that aren't music people, you know, they're trying to convince music faculty to invest in this new book, um, it would give them a tool. They could say, well, you can watch this video and get an idea of how the professor teaches this material. And so I made this video about, uh, uh, the concept is called motivic parallelism. and that deals with the fact that you have something called a motive. It's a very short musical idea. And that short idea is expanded into the broader structure of the piece. So that if you have, for example, a motive that consists of three notes, those three notes might correspond to three different keys that you find over the course of the song. And one really good example of this is the song We Are the Champions by Queen. So this was one of the videos that I made. And I put it up just before Thanksgiving and it went viral over the Thanksgiving uh, break. So just on Facebook views alone, it's up to about 15,500 views at this point, just through Facebook. And I've put it up on YouTube and it's starting to gain some traction there as well. Um, so to illustrate this, in the video I've actually got the the examples from Queen's recording. I wasn't quite sure if we could do that here. I am not going to sound like Freddie Mercury. Nobody sounds like Freddie Mercury. But uh, to start, if you know the song, it basically starts off with the line, I paid my dues Time after time I've done my sentence but committed no crime. Okay, so that opening section has this three note idea. Five, seven, one, one, if we're going with notes in the scale, or sol, te, do, do, or G, B flat, C, C. It's this little three note idea that you hear basically four times. One time is elaborated a little bit, but committed no crime, but it's still those three notes. And then the next phrase takes you from C minor up to E flat major. And we get the same pattern in this new key. And bad mistakes, I made a few, which is then the five, seven, one, one in E flat major. It's not quite the same intervals. It's obviously not the same pitches because we're in a different key, but those three pitches play the same role in that second key that they did in the first key. And then we go on to the part that I can't sing because it's very high, but... And then we get the big operatic. And then we get the chorus. We are the champions, my friends. Now that starts with the same three notes, same three scale degrees, but now in reverse. We are the champions. So it's one, seven, five. It's basically da 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 da, but backwards. And then as we go on toward the end of the chorus, with no time for losers, Same the da 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 da. Same little three note figure. Cause we are the champions. And I know my singing is embarrassing, but at this point, you've also got the da 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 da, which is literally a playground taunt, right? Yeah 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 yeah. We are the champions. And then finally, the very end. This is the best part. The very end of the song of the world. Those no, so those three notes. Get yeah. of the world. It's the da 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 right rearranged now if we take the broad picture of the entire song the first part the verses are in c minor c right then the next part goes to e flat major 
E flat, and then the chorus is F. So da 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 da, which is the same three notes that we've had repeatedly through the song. And the last three that we hear, the of the world, are literally those three pitches. They're just in a different order. So that's what motivic parallelism is. The idea that this little three note figure that's already woven through the melody of the song so intricately is also made up in the three keys that we encounter over the course of the song. I'm writing that down, motivic parallelism. Motivic parallelism. Yes. Stealing yes. that from you. <laughs> and I don't know, that voice sounded pretty good to me. <laughs> also gives you a sort of validation that Freddie was no dummy. You know, I mean, well, right, so that's that true. My, he my, wrote my this, question too is you always you know, wonder about stuff like that. Are we looking at it, you know, in reverse engineering and just noticing, you know, what happened or was it constructed, you know, with an, intentionally that way? I mean, of course, in, in, in some mode, it's definitely intentional, but was he thinking motivic parallelism? Was he thinking 571? I doing get it? this. It's a good question. I get this all the time. It's too bad. Uh, you, you know, you know, yeah, we don't know. Yeah, I get this all the time. And, and, and my answer, which kind of really kind of evades answering the question, is to simply say, it doesn't matter. Right. Right? right. It doesn't matter because it's, it's a fantastic work of beauty that has a fantastic structure. And that's what I want to get at with my students. That it's not just the emotion of the song and what a great song is, it's also a song that is put together very well. Right. Now, as to whether or not this was something that the composers consciously thought of, you know, we can ask the same thing about Mozart, you know, right. as he was jotting his things down on the napkin in the billiard hall, you know, how much was he really thinking about this? And there are actually two great cultural stereotypes that we have in classical music with the figures of Mozart and Beethoven. That Mozart was this supremely gifted individual that just kind of took dictation from the angels and he wrote it down on the napkin and it was perfect, right? And then you have Beethoven who just like agonized for months to come up with da 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 da, right? And there's like the, all the smudges on I the sketchbooks. I heard this exact conversation on the, on the, the Louisville Classical Radio Station yeah. the other day as I was yeah. listening to it. The same, same exact paragraph. Yeah, on the, uh, yeah. So, so you get this idea that musicians are just really gifted, inspired people, but then also you've just you've got to keep practicing. Right. You've got you know, and 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 they're kind of woven woven together. I had a teacher years ago at Illinois, uh, Bruno Nettle, that wrote about this, and that that, right. that article made a huge impact on right. me. The way I think about music, and we t we have the same conversations about like Stevie Ray Vaughan and Jimi Hendrix. You know, like Stevie, there's enough videos of him in interviews where you can go back and you can see him discussing things in a you know, I don't want to, I don't like to use the word intelligent, but in a way that, you know, makes sense terminology wise, you know, yeah. to, to a musician. But with, with Hendrix, there's, there's not a lot, you know, to, to base on. You can, you can kind of perceive the brilliance in it, but do you, how aware was he of what he was yeah, doing? Yeah, so but question. there's a, there's a lot with Hendrix too. Actually with, with, with popular music studies, uh, you know, which is kind of getting more and more intertwined with musicology. One aspect of musicology is looking at things like the Beethoven sketchbooks or the different drafts that Bach wrote wrote of the Mass in B minor or these other things and looking at these early drafts and saying well the composer used that they sure. they didn't use that and now what we've got are things like the demos and the session recordings and things that record companies are putting out right. legitimately sure. and in the case of Hendrix the bootleg stuff that's, that's been true. circulating that, that for years out, so yeah, I mean Hendrix just kept the tape rolling and was mm -hmm. constantly recording and jamming right. and you know, one one definitive book that needs to be written is the book to sort through all of the tapes I don't yeah. think that's ever really been done. Yeah. But I think if you did that, you'd find that there was a lot that was pretty calculated about Hendrix's work as well. well yeah, and that's the thing is, like, again, it's not about calculation. I think it's pretty clear. I think most people know that Hendrix was doing things intentionally, you know? And again, yeah. Yeah. when you talk about Kiss by the Gods or whatever, you know, to, to play the music, there's still, there can still be that intentional, you know, uh, motive behind it. So it's just that versus the, the technicalities of it. You know, you, you always wonder how 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 lined out it was in there in right head, you know right in, in, yeah ahead of time yeah well well freddie mercury was definitely classically trained uh whether or not he would have been familiar with the concept of motivic parallelism right. you know probably <laughs> not but i'm just gonna you know if i take this three note idea and what if i did this right, and what right. if i did this i think that's entirely sure. within the realm of possibility i agree yeah well thank you so much for being here with us thank today. you for having me this has been great and you said where can people find the youtube video just, the, would it be a search? If you did a search for Music Theory Remixed, there should come up about five or six different videos at this point, and I'm working on more. There's going to be more coming out in the weeks to come. 
It, the, the, the videos collectively are not intended to be any kind of a course. You know, it's not like a Khan Academy music theory course. Watch all these videos and you'll know everything you need to know in a, fresh, a freshman music uh, theory course. But instead, they're, they're just various episodic things that treat well, different like aspects it. of music. I, I think it really teaches us to listen to music in a different way. And even as trained musicians, that there's something very profound to learn from looking at songs this way. It's almost like when you learn about making films you go and watch a movie, and all of a sudden, you have a different experience. Right, and then you become that insufferable person yes. at the theater. It's like telling <laughs> that they it. what lens the director used, right? <laughs> right enjoy after that. There's yes. this really great truck shot coming up right there. <laughs> well, we will be back for more of this uh, conversation, as well as talking to one of Dr. Holm Hudson's students, Rob Rawlings, here after the break. Down there, right? 